Live Free Church, we're empowering people to live a life of freedom through Jesus Christ. So, get ready to hear a life-changing and life-empowering message from Pastor Terrell Taylor. You know, how many know that the decisions you make today uh, will impact your later future, right? Your now decisions impact your later future future. I, I had that conversation with my, my three sons yesterday. Uh, you know, my youngest is now in the AAU season and is about to wear me out already. Just had one tournament yesterday, and I'm like, I'm already done. Um, but it's great. You know, we get to go in and support my son, and he's doing great. And But I had my three sons with me yesterday, and we just, you know, my heart was so full because I'm just such a blessed father. I am. I'm really, I have three amazing young men in my home, and not in my home, but kind of in my home. And, uh, you know, but but it's great. And we were talking about how, how our now, uh, how our now decisions, right, our now choices impacts our later future. You know, we, we serve a great God. We serve a God who loves us, right? We serve a God who forgives. We serve a God who, who's there for us, and he's, he's got our back, right? But how many know that God doesn't override our choices? Oh, it's quiet in the house, right? God doesn't override the things that we do. And so sometimes we are so, uh, we're, we're, we're not focused enough to realize that what I'm doing now will impact my future. Whether it's going to school or going back to school or whether it's changing your diet or whether it's getting your finances together. Let me tell you, when me and my wife were in $120,000 of credit card debt, guess what? I had to do something now. Because I know it's going to impact my future, and guess what? We got it all paid off, and I got to get, hey, I got to tell a testimony. God blessed us with a new house. Oh, y'all ain't with me this morning. But if I didn't do anything about that one 25, 6, 7 years ago, I wouldn't be in a new house today. Oh, it's quiet in the house. You know, sometimes we're, we, we find ourselves in, in, in a positions and, and things that we're, we're dealing with and struggling with now. It's because we weren't too smart a few years ago, right? I got a great proverb study. I'm telling you, we have about 15, 16 people get on at 7 a.m., and we talk about life. My wife says, no, it's your therapy session. I said, you're probably right. But we get into it. Talk about co-signing and, 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 and finances and relationships and, and you know, how to, how to present yourself, how to work hard, right? How, how to do your job well, how to serve. I mean, we, you know, Proverbs covers everything because human nature doesn't change. The nature that Adam and Eve have, we still have today, and it's called a sin nature, number one. <laughs> the things we want to do, we know we ain't doing right. Come on, some of the times, we, you know, it, it's a choice. It's a battle. It's a decision. And so we've got to understand that there is a future. Now, we can't be afraid. We don't understand and what it's going to all look like. But what we can do is make some choices now that we know that is going to provide a way for a better tomorrow. Amen? For Blake Mosky, it was when he was in the second season of The Amazing Race. He was competing in Argentina, and while there, he noticed children without shoes in the poorer villages. Not only did they get life-threatening diseases, but they couldn't go to school without any shoes. So he created a company called Tom's Shoes, which stands for Tomorrow. You know, when you buy a pair of Tom's shoes today, they give a pair of shoes to a child in need for a better tomorrow. You know, that's a great story. Also, maybe you've heard of Agnes, right? Agnes was a geography teacher in Calcutta, India. On her way to school, every day she passed by people in horrible, despicable conditions. Her route to work took her by men and women who were homeless and, and destitute and filled with disease. Every day there was something inside her that said, this is wrong. Something is wrong about what I'm seeing. So one day she decided to do something about it. Guess what Agnes did? She quit her job and rallied together a few of her former students. And she began to rescue men and women and children who had been rejected by the local hospital and were literally dying in the streets. We all know her as Mother Teresa. 
And we are still talking about that decision she made this very day. Because that decision she made impacted the future of so many people then. You know, and, and, and here we are. We could be like Tom's shoes or we could be like a Mother Teresa. We can start making decisions that is going to impact someone else's life. And, you know, that's where we are as a church. The decisions we make right now will impact the future of thousands of people for all eternity. So what have we been asking during this series of All In? Listen, we've been asking this question. What could God do in my life? What could God do in your life if we were all in? What could God do with your time, with your talents, and with your treasure? What could God do with Live Free Church if we were all in? Somebody say, I've got to be all in. Oh, that was about 45 of you. Amen. I got that number by the Spirit. Come on, somebody say, we've got to be all in. Amen. we got to be all in. Now, this is the biggest thing, and I've said this last week, that we've ever done as a church. You know, we're going to be celebrating 10 years come uh, September, God willing, the Lord willing. I have my grandma, she used to tell me that. You got to be, you got to say the Lord will. I said, okay, grandma, you know what I'm saying. All right. Uh, but Lord willing, right, 10 years. And so the next seven days are going to be the most defining seven days in the next decade of our ministry, the next decade and beyond. Because it has eternal implications. You know, what better reward could there be uh, when, we, when, when we see people in heaven because of what the decisions we made today? Amen. The decisions we, we make right now can affect someone's eternity. You know, during this series, we've been looking at First, chap, uh, first Samuel chapter 14. We've been using this story as a backdrop uh, for us. And, and, and if you've been with us this last few weeks, this might be your first time hearing it today, but it's a great story. Check it out, uh, uh, 1 Samuel, the 14th chapter. But King Saul and the Israelite people were facing their nemesis, their enemy, the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were this big, powerful uh, army with uh, uh, soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. That's a biblical term that's saying there was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot of them. Kind of like Pastor Lee and Pastor Roy, there's a lot of children, amen, they have in their home. Uh, like Cookmans are like the sand on the seashore, amen. Oh, in the pages as well. God bless, amen. <laughs> Now, I love those families. Amen. Anybody with six kids, you got it going on. You just, you're blessed. You're blessed. But, but Saul decided, right, he, he was facing this big army, and he decided, you know, to say, well, how many do I have? And guess what? He counted his army, and there were only like 600 of them. And, and, and besides that, they had no weapons. Only King Saul and Jonathan had weapons. And, and so they were outnumbered. They didn't have any weapons. What were they going to do? Well, the Bible tells us that the Israelites were scared to death. Scared, the Urban Dictionary translation. Scared. They were scared to death. You know, they, they quaked with fear. And, and besides all this, King Saul, the ruler and the leader and the king of Israel, did absolutely nothing. He didn't do anything about it. How many would like to follow a leader who did nothing? Amen. <laughs> and, and, and so his son, Jonathan, decided to do something. And despite all of the fear and the uncertainty and, uh, that existed, Jonathan took his armor bearer and moved forward in faith despite all the obstacles. See, sometimes, uh, Tara was talking about it, you know, sometimes we have obstacles in our life, but sometimes we allow fear to keep us from moving forward. But Jonathan had a plan. You know, they would show themselves to the Philistines, and if they said, come up here, the Philistines said, come up here, that that was the sign from God that God would deliver the Israelites. So let's pick up the story in verse 12, and we're going to uh, continue in chapter 14, verse 12. It says this. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. Sounds like a bully to me. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. What? We only have 600 people, two swords. Are you kidding me? 
The Lord is giving them into our hand. Well, it goes on. Jonathan, what did he do? What did he do? Climbed up. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. Verse 14, in the first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in the area of about half an acre. All right, so we're talking about 2 verses 20. Last time I checked, that's still being outnumbered, right? <laughs> And picture this for a moment. Jonathan climbed up the hillside with his armor bearer right behind him, right? And the armor bearer, he was a soldier. Some, some of y'all have friends, you know, if, if you get in a scuffle, friends ain't no good, amen, you know. But this bro, he could fight. He was an armor bearer, right? He was trained to protect the king and the king's son. And so Jonathan had taken him with him. And, and when they got to the top, the Bible says that they killed what? 20,000, I mean, 20 soldiers, right? They had killed 20 Philistines, just the two of them. Now, you can talk about uh, God all day, right? And you can talk about what God can, can do through us and do through his people, but you will never see God show up until you have enough faith to climb up. I think I'll say that again. Maybe I'll use my T.D. Jakes voice. <laughs> Get ready! You know you will never see God move mm, <laughs> through you, his people, until you what? Climb on up. Amen. And this is my first point. All in faith requires a climbing up mentality. Write that down because that is going to help somebody today. And all in faith requires what? A climbing up <laughs> mentality. You know, some of us are struggling today because there's some people in your life that they don't have a climb up mentality. Guess what? They have a put down mentality. They're going to put you down. You share your dream. You share your heart. Oh, you can't do that. Who you think you are? Well, you know what? You don't need that voice in your life. You need people around you who is going to encourage you to start a new business. Come on. You need people around you who is going to encourage you to go back to school. You need people around you who is going to say, guess what? You can climb up and be all that you can be and what God has called you to be. It's a mentality. I love being around climb up mentalities. I don't do too well with the put down mentalities. Because a lot of the people who are putting down and saying stuff on social media, they ain't doing nothing themselves. I like to be around people who are doing something for the kingdom of God, who's doing something in life, people who motivate me. Amen? My sons, they motivate me. They can play basketball. They can lift weights. They look good. I said, I'm going back to the gym. Because y'all look good because of me. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> Somebody's shaking their head, Pastor. I'm praying for you. No, a climb up mentality. Listen, there's things that God has called some of you to do, but you've doubted. You've talked yourself out of it. You let other people tell you what you can't do. And so guess what? You stay in the same place. I've been around millionaires, and I've been around broke folks, and I'll take a millionaire any day. Not because they have money. It's because they have a different mentality. Ooh, let me move on because I'm, I'm stepping on somebody today. And all in faith requires a climbing up mentality. Now get this, Jonathan, he didn't have the advantage of knowing the end of the story. Some of you want to know the end of the story. I'm here to let you know you're not in control. There only one, there's only one who knows the end of your story, and that's God. So why not enjoy the now? Amen. I had a friend years ago. He, he, he used to tell me, enjoy the moment. He thought he was a, a modern-day philosopher. I said, okay. But he would say it to me, enjoy the moment. And I said, okay. <laughs> but it stuck with me. Sometimes we're, we're, we're trying to figure out things that are so far in advance that it's robbing you of your blessings in the now. Sometimes I, I never, I, it never ceases to fail me with, um, when I'm with somebody and it seems like they're distracted. Whether they're on their phone or they're thinking about something else, I'm saying, listen, take advantage of this moment. You are with me. 
<laughs> Pastor, I'm praying for you. Just say, Pastor, I'm praying for you. No, 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 but sometimes we've got to learn to take advantage of the moments that God gives us. The moment in worship, amen. The moment, amen, that you're with your son or your daughter. The moment that you're seeing your son play basketball on the court. I treasure those moments. I remember when my oldest son, who's now 25, he was first born. I told Tara, I said, I can't wait till he learns how to crawl. And then it was, I can't wait till he learns how to walk. And then it was, I can't wait, wait till he gets out my house. No, I I never said that. I I never said that. (laughs) But I was always looking to, I'm like, no, 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 slow down. Now he's 25, on his own, doing his thing, amen. A man of God himself. And and, and it's like, whoa, I need to make sure I capture every moment and enjoy the moment that God has given me in the now. Let's continue this story in verse 15. It says this. Oh, I love it. Now, in in, in verse 15, it says, Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and the field, and those in the outpost and the raging parties, uh, raiding parties, and the ground what? The ground shook. (laughs) It was a panic sent by God. You talk about a panic attack. This was a panic sent by God. Verse 16, Saul's lookouts at Gibeah and in Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. Then Saul said to the men who were with him, muster the forces and see who has left us. See, uh, King Saul knew something was going on. So it says, when they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. (laughs) There was somebody who had made a decision to do something, Jonathan and his armor bearer. So his father's like, well, where, what's going on? Find out who's causing some trouble, huh? And we see in verse 15 that God had sent a, a panic, and he had stricken the Philistines, and he had terrorized them. This is more than what we learned about earlier about the Israelites who were quaking with fear, right? This is a bigger thing. God literally sent terror. It was a panic sent by God. The ground shook. uh, shook. Some translations say that that, that there there was an earthquake. (laughs) I don't know if anybody been in an earthquake, but that's nothing fun, right? The ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. And Saul, who, who should have been doing something, right, but he was sitting around and he was sitting under the pomegranate tree and he was wondering what was going on. And so he's like, who's not here? And he found out it was Jonathan and Jonathan's armor bearer who decided to do something. Let's pick up verse 20. It says, then what? Then Saul. Wow. Okay, king, you, you're going to decide something now. Huh? <laughs> See, some of y'all joined the party a little, little late, right? <laughs> But it says, then Saul and all his men, what, assembled and went to the battle. They found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. Those Hebrews had been, who had been previously been with the Philistines and, and had gone up with them to their camp went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan, verse 22. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, guess what they did? They joined the battle in hot pursuit. Oh, I like that. You know, Saul quickly, when he saw what was going on, he called his army together. Then he led them to the Philistine camp, and when he got there, he's seen that the, the people are destroying themselves, right? They were confused, and, and they were killing each other. And the Israelites who were once hiding in caves and who were once quaking with fear, now they saw God working, right? And guess what they did? They joined the battle. My second point this, and all in faith joins the battle. What? And pursues the enemy. There's times in our life where we've got to make up our, our minds. We've got to say, you know what? God, I see what you're doing, and I know I've been afraid. I know I've been quaking with fear. I know I haven't had a climb up mentality, but guess what? I'm going to join this battle because I know who wins in the end. Amen? And then you've got to have a mentality to pursue the enemy. You know, in 2023, it's evident that we are in a battle. We are in a battle for the souls of men, women, and children. 
You know, divorce rates are up. Marriage rates are down. And people are confused all around. It sounds like a hip-hop song to me. Will y'all purchase my CD? Divorce rates is up and marriage rates are down. And people are confused all around. <laughs> Sound like a dead seal out there. See, I just, I know y'all said, Pastor, you sound like a dead cell. I just, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> you know, some of y'all need to have some fun in life. I, you know, me and my wife, we're, we're just talking and, and, you know, laying in the bed, and we're just laughing at stuff. You're just so silly, Terrell. I don't know why I married you. Because <laughs> I want to, I wanna, listen, if, if there's a battle going on, I'm at least going to have some fun during the battle. Amen. But there's a lot going on, right? There's a battle raging. And, and, and kingdom people on assignment, right? We are not to sit under the pomegranate tree. But we have to pursue the enemy. We have to have a mentality that says, listen, we're going to pursue the enemy by how? By advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The devil's been around a long time. We can't outsmart him. We can't outtrick him, right? But we have a God who created him. <laughs> we have a God, amen, who, who, who is all-knowing and all-powerful. God sees the battle raging, but he's just waiting on some of us to get in the battle so that we can pursue the enemy by advancing the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to give God a hand praise in this place today. That's how we pursue the enemy. We can't out-trick him. We can't outsmart him. You're not smart enough to figure out what and what not to do. That's why you've got the word telling you what and what not to do. Well, you know, it's just I feel this. The, the, you know, I, everybody's cohabitating now. I used to call it shacking. Now that's offensive. I say cohabitation. So many Christians cohabitating. I mean, there's just all kind of stuff going on. But we're not smart enough to figure out what, what's all the consequences going to be but, but, but because I'm making this wrong choice today. See, God knows. That's why God says do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Because life is hard enough by itself. But when we add foolishness to it, oh, it's going to get real hard. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so pursue the enemy by advancing the kingdom, but by, by, by what? Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Letting people know, God, that there's a, there's a God who sent his only son to die for your wretched self. I love that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I knew a pastor who took that word and he, cha he changed it to someone. And I said, no, you should have kept the wretch because the Anyway, I'm not going to go there. Something bad happened in his life. He wasn't living the life that he proclaimed he was living. But no, we're all wretched. We're all wretched. Wretched. No, wretch. Wretched. We're all in need of a Savior. Amen? And that's the good news. That's the good news. We have to let people know, no, you can't do it on your own. There was someone who came and died for you, and guess what? You have an eternal home that is beyond this life. If this was all there is to it in this life, man, Paul says we're men, we're people, we're women most miserable. And so there's a battle, and guess what? We've got to advance. We've got to go into the battle. How many know you've been drafted into the army of the Lord? When you gave your life to Jesus, you were drafted into an army. I don't know how many of you remember this song, but it's a song I used to sing in my church growing up. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Oh, we need to have one of them church services. I see. I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. All right, now y'all ain't singing. Y'all, the rest of y'all need to sing. Y'all, I need some more warriors up in here. Amen. <laughs> but listen, we're, we're soldiers. Listen, when you gave your life to Christ, you signed up for a battle. You became a target for the enemy. 
And, and some of us, we need to have this mentality that says, you know what? I am going to give it all that I have because with whatever, how many ever years I have on this earth, when I come to the end of my life, when I'm standing before God, I want him to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. Let's pick up the story in verse 23. So on that day, guess what God did? What? He saved Israel. And the battle moved beyond, everybody say, Beth Aven. Say it again, Beth Aven. Wow, I know there's going to be a Beth Aven born in this church. Amen. Hallelujah. Somewhere. Beth Aven, right? I'm going to point something out to you. So the day the Lord saved Israel, the battle moved beyond Beth Aven. Now, look how this story ends, right? The Lord rescued Israel. The Lord saved Israel. It doesn't say Jonathan rescued Israel. It doesn't say the armor bearer, what, rescued Israel. It says on that day the Lord, what, saved Israel. You can take that off the screen right now because I want them to focus on something. Listen, family, we are on the edge of what God has for us. You know, in, in the same verse, it says that the battle moved beyond Beth Aven. Now, in Beth Aven, in the Hebrew language, it literally means the house of idolatry. The house of idolatry. Listen, if we're going to move the battle forward, we are going to have to get past some idols that are in our lives lives. Ooh, the battle moved beyond the house of idolatry. The most common idols in America, I just did a quick search and these, these things stood out to me. A pastor listened and I, it was very fascinating. Number one, the idol of self. If we're going to advance the battle and advance the gospel, we've got to get past the idol of self. You know, there's so much attention available now through likes and, and loves and, and hearts and followers. You know, we've become addicted to attention because we focus our eyes upon ourselves rather than on the Lord, the idol of self. I don't know, I no longer call this an iPhone. This is a God phone. Yeah. I got to change my language. <laughs> you know, because so many people are so preoccupied with self, they can't even get past themselves to help somebody else. Number two, idol America, the idol of status. You know, the idolation of status is the aspiration that once you reach a position in, in, in the economic ladder or, or at work, right, or you have a certain amount of followers or your social media now has a little blue dot or, or a check mark by your Twitter account, you, you've arrived. <laughs> right? Maybe you bought a, a, a new house in an upscale neighborhood. Ah, I've arrived. But when those status symbols are both the end goal, both the goal and, and, and what you're focusing on, guess what? The driving force behind your life, it, it becomes an idol in your life. When you're all about status and you're not about who God is in you, then that's an idol in your life. Number three, there's an idol of technology. You know, technology can be a beautiful thing, but when we look to technology to save us, guess what happens? We are in trouble. There are teams of people right now working to find ways to upload our brains and our consciousness to a computer. Ray Kurzweil says it's just, this is going to happen by year 2045. Woo, ain't hooking me up to nothing. You barely hooked me up. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. But it, it's real. I had that conversation with my son yesterday. Elon Musk is, is right on the a cusp of putting something, whatever, in the back of your head, and they can do all kind of stuff. It's called transhumanism. They're wanting to merge machine and, 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 humanism, and humans so that we can live forever. It's a lie. They're going to try it. But the idol of technology, there's people who idolize that. Number four, the idol of social media. Ding, ding. You look down and at the lit up screen, right? <laughs> 
to see if anybody's liked or the red badge or the red, you know, whatever's on your screen, the new notifications. You know, some of us just need to turn notifications off. It bugs me when I go into a, uh, and I'm buying something, whether it's a restaurant or, or, or a Kroger or something, and the person that's supposed to be helping me is on their phone. Excuse me. I'm here. What I'm about to buy helps you get your paycheck. Can you give me a little attention? So distracted. People are not working as good. They're, 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 they're on their social media all day. And, and guess what? You know, it, it's interesting how when you do a quick Google search, right, it reveals that people on average spend nearly two hours a day on social media. That's average. Some do it more, some a little less. Two hours, what could you do with two hours a day? Build a business. Read a book. Go back to school. Help someone, you know, uh, and, and serve. I mean, what could you do with two hours a day that's taking up your time? And, and we all know the stats say that you're more lonely when you're just trying to, to be on social media. This is, this is really how God created it to be. Somebody just touch the person next to you and say, this is all right. This is all right. This is how it's supposed to be, right? This is how it's supposed to be. The human touch. Don't slap your neighbor. Just touch your neighbor. Amen. <laughs> it cannot be duplicated. You cannot improve on what God has designed. We're even going to have a resurrected body. We're not going to be disembodied spirits. We're going to have a flesh and bone body. Isn't that amazing? In Earth 3.0, oh, my God, I can't wait. Tara's going to be like, man, I knew you were fine then, but baby, look at what God has done for you. <laughs> I love it. I love making people laugh. I do. But another idol, there's an idol of celebrities. Woo, can we talk about this a little bit? You know, America rides on the waves of the Hollywood actors and actresses and sports figures and entertainment influencers. You know, these celebrities cover our newsstands and, and our headlines and, and have, of course, uh, large social media followings. We idolize these celebrities by constantly what? Seeking to mimic their dress, follow their every move, and wishing we were them. We think our lives would be so much better. If I was only Denzel Washington, no. <laughs> he got to live his life. I got to live my, my life. You know, we can't idolize people. And even in the church, we have Christian celebrities, right? People that were idol. Let me just tell you, nobody died for you except Jesus. And so when you hear something about a celebrity or you hear something about an a, a, a influencer or someone who has a name or a following, and you say, wow, yeah, it's because they're human. They weren't created to be worshipped. And we weren't created to worship other humans. Only God. Only God. Now, we could admire, we can say, man, they put in a lot of work. Man, they have a great talent, and, and man, you know, that, that's cool. But to want to be like somebody else, I want to be like Mike? No. How many remember that campaign, just be like Mike? Yeah. Remember that? You're going to start a campaign. I want to be like T. Hines. I just want to be like T. Hines, you know. <laughs> no, we got to be like who God created us to be. You know, when you get to a place where you can say, God, I thank you. For creating me, me. You will, go, you will go far in life. When you get to a place that you start thanking God for creating you however he did, and you start acknowledging his greatness in your life, and you start acknowledging how really rare you are because no one has your same DNA or your fingerprint, your eye red, and listen, you are rare. You're the only you that's ever been created out of billions of people who've ever existed. That's pretty fascinating. So take your eyes off of other people, and, and it might not even be celebrities. It just might be somebody you know. Listen, start saying, God, who am I? Start just loving who God created you to be. Oh, there should be some amens in this place. Number six, there's an idol of materialism or consumerism here in America. 
You know, modern America is infested with the spirit of consumerism. Uh, also, we'll call it materialism, right? This is the mindset uh, and continual pursuit of what? Material goods. It is the continual accumulation of worldly possessions. You know, when is enough enough? Scripture calls this what? Um, mammon. You can't serve God and what? Materialism or mammon. Your money. Things that your money buys. You can't, you can't serve both. Listen, I, I enjoy a good whatever on a good day. But I, I listen, I, I told my sons we were out, and, and, you know, I love to take my sons out and pay for their meal, and they're very appreciative. And let me just tell you, if anybody takes you out and you don't buy anything, say thank you. Because when you don't, that's the last time I'm taking you out. I've learned, my boys have learned to be very appreciative, and that really blesses me. But we were talking about, like, hey, you, you've got to live, right, in, in your means, right? If your skill set has demanded a certain level of income, well, praise God. Live within your means. But don't try to keep up with the Joneses. I don't know how the Joneses got that rap. But don't try it. No, no. Because you're trying to keep up with this materialism and this consumerism mentality that we have, this idol here in America, Every commercial saying, do this, do this now. You'll just feel better if you buy this new car. No, I won't because my car is paid off. And I don't want to pay another car payment until I have to. I'm riding. I'm almost at $200,000 in my, I mean, 200,000 miles in my GMC. It's just going to have to break down. <laughs> because we're, we're thinking stuff is going to make us happy. We're thinking these things are going to provide a level of, of joy and, and, and happy, but it, but it doesn't because enough is never enough. That's why I've taught you guys uh, many, many months ago in one of my messages that contentment is managing what you have well. Contentment is managing what you have what? Well. Whoa, I'm doing some good teaching today. Is that all right, Pastor Lord? Are you all right, man? Pastor Lord, tell me I'm doing good. I'm all right. <laughs> my last one, the idol of money. Remember, we got to move. To get to the battle, we got to move beyond Beth on Van, right? Idolatry, the, the idol of money. You know, there are some who seek out the accumulation of money and, and you know, just because they can have this certain number in their bank account. You know, family and friends and, and relationships sometimes are sacrificed because of the pursuit of money. And, and, and they, they sacrifice relationships. They sacrifice family. They sacrifice all those things because they want more and more and more. Now, I'm not telling you that earning a great income, it, no, God is all about us working hard. God is all about us being generous. God is all about us doing what we're pro purposed to do in life. But when the money becomes the focus, right, and you start making decisions based upon money, you, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. It's an idol in your life. It's the pursuit of mammon. And God and mammon can't coexist in our life. Amen? Now, I know we're in America. I've, I've done missions in other countries. And let me tell you, there's no other country I'd rather live than America. Some people hate America. Some people, I'm like, you know what? You wouldn't say that in Russia. What you just said, you wouldn't say that in Russia. What you just said, you wouldn't say that in that country over in Africa. They, they kill you. But over in America, we can say whatever we want about whoever we want because it's free. But what's happening is these idols are consuming us. They're taking over us, right? And we've got to understand that as kingdom people who have to advance, right, the, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ, it says this, number three, all in faith moves the battle beyond the idols in our lives. Just write that down. Chew on that for a moment. Some of us have got to get past some of these idols in our lives. If we're going to have this faith that moves us, right, the battle on, we've got to recognize some things and begin to move with God. Amen? Because these idols are not going to satisfy us. If we're going to move the battle forward, let's get past these idols in our lives. You know, then an all-in, it's, it's just, it speaks so much. To what God wants to do, not only in our lives, not, our, not only in our families, 
not only in our church, but in our community, in our city, in our world. I'm just so excited about what we are pursuing as a congregation. You know, um, I had one of our members tell me recently, they said, you know, Pastor Terrell, I really love how you're planning this out. You're not putting a lot of uh, pressure on the people because it, this is, can be some pressure when you're told to get out of a building that we were in for years and we didn't know we had to get out in a matter of months. <laughs> and in that first campaign, we raised uh, uh, probably about nine to 100K or so, somewhere in there in our prepare campaign, not knowing what exactly we were going to do with that money. But guess what? God had it for us so that we could come here. Amen. And we could do all of this beautiful work. Amen. Give God a hand praise on that. Amen. That took $100,000. Now, this next campaign, I'm saying I'm, I'm raising the bar even higher. I'm saying, okay, our, our lease is up in 2026. I don't know. Will we, will we go all that way? I, I don't know. I don't know. I just have to believe and preach and teach and encourage us as a congregation to be all in. So because I, I really want us to raise $300,000. And I've told you before, I've known ministries and, and churches and people have mortgaged houses and sold all kind of stuff to the bill. I said, man, that, that's pretty good. Maybe I'll, I'll do that one day. Amen. Start with my own house. <laughs> no. Uh, but no, I don't want that kind of pressure. So what I'm saying is, hey, let's, let's do this campaign for the next four years. Uh, starting this month, it's being from a March to a March season. Let's raise 75000 in the first year. And let's keep raising that money. What is that going to take? 50 people giving uh, $1,000 during the course of the year beyond their giving and tithes and offerings. That's about $85 a month or so extra. For some of you, that's Starbucks. I mean, man. <laughs> Pastor, I fasted for a year for Starbucks. Here is my building campaign money. Amen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's going to take about 50 people giving 1,000, and it's going to take another 50 people giving 500. I, I shared with you last week, I'm so proud of my youngest son. He said, Dad, I, I want to give $100 to the building, building fund. I said, are you sure, son? He said, yeah, Dad. I said, okay, we're going to do that. He doesn't have a job. He saves his money from all his birthday parties he has. Yeah. But he wants to give. And let me tell you, that, I mean, whoo. Maybe I'll start a Trenton building fund. We give one-sixth of whatever we have in our bank accounts. Amen. Because <laughs> that's going to be a big commitment on his part. And I'm so proud of you, son. That's awesome. We had another member of our church recently. Uh, she, she gave four years' worth of her pledge. She gave $4,000 recently. She said, Pastor, here, this is done. I'm, I'm all in. And, hey, I'm good now. I'm like, wow, this is a blessing. Thank you. We have several others who said they're, they're ready. And so next week, uh, we're, we're going to start, uh, we're going to have some pledge cards for you. And, and this, let me tell you this, we're not going to collect these. Can I tell you why? Because me and my finance team, we get frustrated when we collect them and we're seeing that you're not doing what you said you're going to do. Woo, pastor, did you just say that? Yes, I did. So we're going to let you keep it. Whatever you pledge, I will never see what you pledge. You're going to keep it? And you're going to take it home, and it's between you and God and your family. Amen? And then we'll, we'll give reports as the building fund is, is kicking off. And, and some of this, of course, we have, um, we're getting ready to get some new lights and, and different things that we have to continue in our media. So uh, that, that's coming out. Someone also recently gave about $9,000 to the building fund, even before we kicked it all in. Isn't that a blessing? Wow. And, and so... I'm all in. I, I'm just hoping you all are all in, and I'm hoping that we can go ahead and continue to move forward. And, and I'm going to conclude here in just a moment. But I've got to teach you something that is very powerful. You've heard me teach it years ago, and I've referenced it over time. But it's called the generosity ladder. And, you know, this model uh, could help us understand uh, steps in our generosity. Number one, step one is spontaneous generosity, okay? Step number one is spontaneous generosity. Everybody say spontaneous generosity. Come on, say it like you mean it, spontaneous generosity. You know, this is when you see someone, of course, that, that is in need. Maybe they're on a street corner or they're in downtown Atlanta or, you know, you're, you're coming from an Atlanta Hawks game and you give somebody a couple of dollars. That's spontaneous generosity, right? 
you know, um, that's a good thing. That's a blessing. Uh, but this is what I call the starting point of generosity, right? You know, you're, you're beginning to not allow money to have a grip on you. Let me tell you, it's so good to be a generous person. Woo! It is so much joy when you are a generous person, you're giving and, and you're helping people, whether it's someone you don't know or, or a family member. It, it just feels good. Amen? But step number two in the generosity ladder is what I call systematic generosity. Everybody say systematic generosity. Right? This is when you have a plan, a systematic plan to be generous. Maybe it's a weekly or bi-weekly or on a monthly basis. Uh, there's a reference of it in 1 Corinthians where Paul's talking about co- taking up a collection uh, uh, for, for, uh, for those who are impoverished in Jerusalem. And he said, hey, put aside a certain amount of money every week. He was saying, be systematic in your generosity. You know, be predetermined in that. And, and it's really cool because, you know, we've had with Total Choir, and we'll have them back. And we've, you know, uh, some of you support them. Some of you support World Vision or Compassion International or other things where you give systematically to those ministries and, and uh, every month, right? Some of you support, uh, you know, uh, children in India or in Africa. Well, hey, it's maybe $30 a month or 50 Well, that's what we call what? Systematic generosity. It's a blessing helping others in need. And you know every month it's going to be there. And those companies know every month how they can de- depend on you. It's a blessing. I have, there's a young lady we support and we, I, I write her letters because my family's too busy, so I'm the one that does it, right? And, and we correspond, and, and one day I told Tara, I said, we're going to go over and meet her. We've been supporting her for many, 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 many years, and she's just growing up before our eyes. And I said, one day we're going to go visit that country in Africa, and we're going to get to meet her person because I just love what God is doing in our life. And, and it's like $45 a month commitment. But it goes a long way, amen? Any generous people in here today, Amen. Woo, pastor, I just don't like when pastors talk about money. Ah, well, sorry. Step number three is spiritual uh, generosity. Spiritual generosity. Well, pastor, what is that? Well, this is what the Bible calls tithing, right? Tithing simply means 10%. Whatever you make in the course of a year, drop a zero. And that should be you giving away to your local church or or to charities. Some people don't have local churches. They give to charities, however that looks like. But that's what we call spiritual generosity. In Leviticus 27 and 30, it says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain or from the soil or from the fruit of the trees, guess what? Belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Woo! How many want to sing a song? Holy, holy, holy. And then let's, let's write a song about Leviticus 27 and 30. Can we do that? Everything you belongs to the Lord is holy, is holy. Everything you get, it, uh, 10% is holy. I'm going to write that song, you know, I'm going to write that song. We did one of my songs this morning. I can write a song. I can write a song. I'm going to write that song. A tithe of the Lord is holy. We're going to be going and Pastor Lee going to go, no, 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 Somebody say, don't do it, Pastor Lee. (laughs) But it's holy. Hallelujah. No, so here's my question. Why does the tithe belong to the Lord? Why is it holy? Because everything, it belongs to the Lord. When you have a mindset that God has blessed you with everything you have and it really all belongs to him, then it's not a fight. If the land, grain, soil, and fruit, and all the trees, and the earth is the Lord's, and it belongs to him, guess what? Who are we (laughs) to argue with how God has set this thing up? It belongs to the Lord, right? If you have been given to, uh, you've been a a steward, right, uh, of the things that God has blessed you with. If you are a kingdom man, you're a kingdom woman, guess what? You should be a generous spiritual person, a spiritually generous person. It says the 10% is holy, not the 90%. Well, pastor, I tithe 5%. No, 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 5 is not 10. Pastor, I I, I tithe 15%. No, 15 is not 10. 
Well, pastor, I've read on the internet there's so many uh, thoughts about this. Yes, me too. This is how I choose to live my life in generosity. The tithe is kadosh. It means to be set apart. It means to be consecrated. I'm talking about, woo, spiritual generosity today. It's to be honored and treated as sacred. It is to be dedicated and devoted and separated. Well, you know, Pastor, woo, what I could do with that 10%, I know what you can do with it because you've got the new car out there. I know. My team knows who's the tithers. They know. Pastor, you know what I, I, I know. But it's holy. It's supposed to be dedicated to the work and the move of God. It's supposed to be separated, right? It's sacred. It's just not another bill you pay. It's just not another expense on your expense account. When you begin to see the tithe as holy and it's going toward, amen, advancing the purpose and the agenda of God, amen, you will see your life change. Spiritual generosity. Pastor, I am smarter than you. Matter of fact, I'm smarter than God. I don't believe in tithing. Okay. I am not going to twist your arm. I am, I'm not here to convince you because, listen, this is what me and my wife do, and we are blessed. This is what some of you, maybe, I don't know, maybe 20% of you in this church do, but we're, we're blessed. This is about 20, 25% of you. Imagine if 50% of us did this. Woo! Imagine if 80% of us did this. I had a pastor friend. I was talking. He said, you know what we do? We give a money-back guarantee. I said, well, I ain't going to go that far. Tithe for a year, and if it doesn't work, we'll give it back to you. Nah, it just sounds a little bit like, you know, everything else you hear on TV. That's him and it ain't me. You ain't going to hear me doing that at Live Free. I'm going to say try it for a year, and if it don't work, then we keep your money. <laughs> I'm a realist. No, but whether no, but it works. It works because what happens is you you depending on God. The ten percent is holy, so you're just giving that back to Him, and God is going to dictate, Amen, how that is going to change a life for all eternity. Amen. Spiritual generosity leads to my last point here: spirit, uh, sacrificial generosity. Step number four in the generosity ladder is sacrificial generosity. Now, sacrificial giving is when you have the revelation, again, you understand that everything belongs to God. Really, who are you? You are a conduit for God's purposes. Pastor, I was not taught like this. You know, I grew up in a, in a home. We barely had anything, and I had to learn how to hold on tight. I understand. My heart goes out to you. My parents, man, when I was born, we were, whew, and we were eating chicken backs. Not chicken breasts, chicken backs. <laughs> Sometimes I had shoes with holes in them. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, I, I can identify at a certain level. I really can. But when you understand, okay, pastor is trying to help me get past, I need a, I need a climb up mentality. I'm trying to get past that impoverished mentality that says everybody wants something from me. No. God is trying to get something to you. God is trying to get something through you. Amen. It's a mentality. And so when, you, when you're generous, it, it also leads to this sacrificial generosity. And, and, and it's a really amazing story. When, when Moses was constructing the tabernacle, he said, people, we need you to bring your offerings. We need you to bring things to help get this going. And guess what? The people, the Israelites brought so much to the building of the tabernacle that Moses had to say, stop giving. Woo, I can't wait to the day that we are, we are meeting our goal in 300,000 and I say, stop. No, reverse. We could do more. Oh, yeah, 350. Amen. <laughs> but Moses literally had to tell them to stop giving. They were all so generous, and it was a sacrificial generosity. And that's what all in this new campaign 
for our building fund, it's going to ask us to make a commitment to go beyond our normal giving within the next year. Amen. Let's give God a hand praise. Woo! Y'all can do better than that. Amen. Y'all think it's easy to preach and teach this stuff? No. But I'm scared of terror. I ain't scared of you. Amen. <laughs> no, I'm really trying to just help you. I'm trying to help you to climb up. Don't make any more excuses. Don't allow fear to grip you. Just trust God. Trust God with your generosity. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for Live Free Church. We thank you for this all-in campaign for the next four years, God, to raise, Lord, somewhere around the 300000 so we can be in position to do what you called us to do in our next season and phase of life and phase of this ministry and phase of this church community. Lord, we thank you that Live Free Church, Lord, is a place where every age, ethnicity, culture, and background can come together in one place to experience the love and the presence of God. Lord, we thank you that Live Free Church is a place where we can, where the lost can find salvation and forgiveness. A place where people can find hope and, and build their faith. A place where people are baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for Live Free Church. Lord, a place where people are telling their life story of change and freedom through Jesus Christ. A place where the found are so deeply committed to Christ that they are serving the poor, giving sacrificially, engaging with those who are far from God. And Lord, Lord, we want to turn Gwinnett County upside down for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Live Free Church. Lord, a place where we are, are, are generous, Lord, and we're committed, Lord, in generosity so that we can continue to bless, Lord, missions and, uh, and, and, and national, local missions and missions around the world. We thank you that even as a church, we give 10% of the income that comes in as a church. We give it away, Lord. We're grateful for a generous church. Lord, Live Free place, uh, is a place where we have people who are making a difference, Lord, in the lives of others, Lord. It's a place of hope and healing for the hurting and the broken. Lord, it's a place, Lord, that we can serve our community in transformative ways. Thank you for Live Free Church. I'm honored, Lord, to be the pastor. I'm honored, Lord, to be the spiritual uh, leader, Lord, of, of this house. I'm honored, God, to serve with my assistant pastors, Pastor Tara and Pastor Laura and Pastor Lou, Pastor Cheryl, Pastor Rory and Pastor Lee. Lord, I'm honored to serve Lord, with my fellow brothers and sisters, Lord, and loving this community. I'm honored to serve with our other leaders, Lord, ministers Terrence and Lauren Hines and our dear sister Adina, Lord, and, 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 and uh, Grady and, and Dixie Coleman, Lord God, ministers Angela, Lord, and Marvin Oglesby. I'm so grateful for our dear sister Wanda serving in Freedom Town and our loved ones, our little ones, us so grateful, God, for our team, the pages, Lord, Bobby and Sean, and how they are so dedicated, Lord, to, to this community of believers. I love my lead team. I love my pastors. I love serving with men and women of God who are helping us empower people and live a life of freedom through Jesus Christ. We are grateful, Lord. And I'm thankful, God, for those who are members of Live Free Church who call Live Free home. Lord, I'm just grateful for then making a decision, Lord, to be a part of this family and serving and giving and, 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 Lord, just doing their part and their assignment within this body so that we, Lord, can help others, Lord, experience the freedom that we experience. Lord, I thank you for those who are visiting, those who are guests, Lord, those who, Lord, who, who are watching and joining us online. Lord, we are grateful that they would take their time to be a part, Lord, of our worship experience this morning. God, you have so much in store for us and our families. When I was lost in sinking.